Debbie Gartland earned her bachelor's degree in special education and elementary education from Westfield State College in 1978. Dr. Gartland served in teaching and administrative roles in public education. She was an instructor at Pennsylvania State University until she accepted a faculty position at Towson State University in 1986. These are her reflections. Dr. Gartland, thank you so much for sharing your history, your preparation to become a teacher, and your consequent career in education. This will add a great deal to our understanding of the evolution of teacher education at Towson University across time. And I guess a good place to begin is in the beginning. So if you would, we would love for you to share a little bit about your early social context, where you grew up as you went through school, what you were thinking about in terms of a career. Okay. Uh, well, I grew up outside of Boston, which I'm tired, so you'll be able to hear that in my accent. <laughs> my husband says when I talk to my family or when I'm tired, you can hear my Boston accent, even though I haven't lived there in years. <laughs> um, I come from a family of teachers, so they have pictures of me when I was four and five downstairs in my basement with the same little red from my table and rocking chair and chair that I have in my basement now <laughs> from when my girls were young. And they have pictures of me with a blackboard and chalk teaching my stuffed animals. So I guess I was destined to be a teacher. Uh, and again, my mom had uh, taught school, uh, taught post-secondary um, finishing schools in those days mm -hmm. for models in Boston. She taught business. Uh, and then my two sisters were teachers, and uh, my mom went back to teach public schools when the four of us were in school ourselves. So um, I also had a great public school experience, K through 12. I mm -hmm. grew up in a city right outside of Boston where they always claim to be innovators in education and Newton Public Schools, and they're always on the same list as some of the school systems around here in terms of innovation. So. Uh, I guess I was always acculturated that way uh, mm -hmm. to be in education. Uh, and when I uh, was looking for colleges, my parents asked some professors that were neighbors who taught at Harvard, not in education. And they said, if, if she wants to be a teacher, the best place is state colleges. Uh -huh. So it's very different nowadays when kids go and apply to colleges. Um, I had one application, and I got three free state colleges on there for the same fee. And so I put on three state schools and got into them, and then I went to visit. And I had always thought I'd be in elementary education or in math education. Uh, and when I went to visit Westfield State uh, College in mid-Massachusetts, uh, a family friend was there, a dean, and he was actually retiring at that point um, from that college and going to the Gallaudet, and said, she should really consider special ed. I've seen her. She should consider special mm -hmm. education. So in Massachusetts, you couldn't just major in special ed. I don't know if they didn't think it was going to be around long enough. <laughs> uh, but you had to have a dual major, not uh, two separate majors, unlike what we have now here. Uh -huh. And so I majored in elementary education and special education and had to do all the L ed courses as well as the student teaching, mm. all the special ed courses separately as well as special ed student teaching. And then I, uh, had to, I came out with two certifications that were separate. And when I left, I, was, I felt that it was very I was very well prepared. Mm -hmm. I really didn't have a lot of the uh, first year jitters because the program was very practical. And I always try to remember that when I'm teaching here, mm -hmm. that although we had a theor theoretical base, and at that time the federal special ed law was coming about mm -hmm. based on the Massachusetts special ed law, um, but I always felt very grounded in theory, but able to you know, have a pretty good first year. So I always try to remember that when I'm teaching classes, that you need to have theory, but it needs to be very practical so that we're equipping our mm -hmm. teacher candidates when they go out in the field with you know, you know, solid background. So, so I taught there for four years uh, in, in Western Massachusetts after that um, in a uh, K through eight school. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that very much and I was a special educator and then I, they had an opening for an assistant principal and I decided uh, I wanted to go into administration uh, and I was working on my master's degree in North Adams State College. I'm a product of state colleges. Mm -hmm. It's now Massachusetts College for Liberal Arts. Oh. 
uh, and they didn't have a master's in special ed, but they had ed education administration with, I put an emphasis in special ed. Mm -hmm. So I was getting certifications along the way, in addition to the L ed and the special ed, I had picked up a reading certification, a reading specialist, and administration. So I decided to go into administration, and I was an assistant principal for a couple of years, and special ed was still starting um, really on the horizon nationally, so I decided I loved it and I didn't know all I needed to know and so I took the dive and I retired right, I resigned from my position I went um, back full-time for my PhD in at Penn State in special mm -hmm. education can I go back to your experience as a teacher candidate and what you recall about the nature of that program as as of course you live and know state of Maryland requires that teacher preparation be done in a PDS setting and, um, but you sound as though you were very confident coming out of your program. Did you get to go to, into schools before you actually did a student teaching experience? Yes, and, I, and I, that shaped a lot of my experience, even back then, shaped a lot of how I um, try to influence our program here at Towson. It was, um, as I mentioned, very practical, and if you had, as I did, indicate on your application to the college that you might be leaning towards an education field, they, I was out in the field my first semester as a freshman. Wow. We had a lab school, mm -hmm. I, and it was only maybe a couple of hours a week, and it was uh, just doing bulletin boards and being, you know, helping the teacher line the children up, and nothing that with a heavy instructional duty, but it did help uh, to solidify my decision to stay in education, and for a lot of my friends with whom I lived in the dorm, um, it also helped them decide that education was not for them. So every semester that I was in at Westfield State, uh -huh. every semester we had to be in the classroom, and starting from freshman year. So I thought that was really a very smart, strategic move uh, to allow us to, you know, the 18, 17, 18, 19 mm -hmm. year olds to know whether or not that was a field they wanted to dedicate their college years to and maybe their life to, as some of us have. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was wonderful. And then because I had the dual majors, the two yes. majors. Uh, I had to do the practicum in L ed, the practicum in special ed, and then also um, student teaching. And I guess that's a huge change uh, from nowadays. Yes. We, I was, I can remember it was um, second semester of my third year, uh, my last year, I had brought some credits in. Uh, so it was in the middle of a year, I was plopped into an L ed setting in general education in a very affluent community. Mm -hmm. And I was in first grade and you know, plopped in on a Monday, let's say eight weeks later on a Friday, plopped down. I loved having the experience, it was great. I loved my cooperating teacher, they were called at the time. <clears throat> I loved the community and the children. I loved first grade. And then I had the weekend to recover <laughs> and then I was plopped back into another situation, a special ed student teaching for eight weeks then. Uh, and this was in an inner city in Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm. And so the community was very different. It was a special ed placement, so the needs of the children were very different. Uh, the socioeconomic status of the families that fed into the school was so different from East Long Meadow, mm -hmm. where I did my gen ed placement. Um, but and again, was I was very supported, and um, I had, I just remember feeling after that, and they did allow me to only do one rotation in both gen ed and special mm -hmm. ed. Uh, instead of the, the full semester in both. Um, but it was, it was really great experience. I loved my years at Westfield. Did you, in the special ed setting, was that in a resource room kind of set up? Um, it Which was. probably would have been it, fairly it, standard. It, yes, it, but um, it, was, uh, it was dependent upon the, the children. So for some of them, it was a substantially separate setting. Uh -huh. So that when they got off the bus, they came right to our classroom and stayed all day, five uh -huh. days a week. But for some, it was a resource room setting, which was a part-time special class. So mm -hmm. they would get off the bus, go to a homeroom, and then spend portions of their time with us five days a week. And some would be only a half an hour, 45 minutes for, uh, per day. Some would be up to maybe a half a, a day mm -hmm. in our room. That was the model back then mm -hmm. uh, in the, the late 70s, early 80s. So. Mm -hmm. So you do all this, you get into a classroom, and you said that you started as a first grade teacher? That was my um, student, student teaching, right. And so the um, special ed student teaching was 
uh, probably K through five or six, whatever the grade level was. Mm -hmm. And so when I graduated, I felt like I enjoyed both experiences. And uh, because of that, I was able to uh, go on interviews for both just gen ed and special education. At the time in Massachusetts, we had, I graduated actually a year early um, to, because I could credit wise, mm -hmm. but also we had something called Proposition Two and a Half in Massachusetts, which was cutting mm -hmm. across the board. And so there were far fewer teacher uh, positions available. And so I thought, well, I'd taken all the courses. I was, had dual certification. Um, and why don't I start in the field a year ahead of everyone else, I'd be competing for a job if I waited till mm -hmm. uh, 79 when I was supposed to graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I was able to, when I went on uh, interviews, to say, what do I like about this job that they're offering me in special education? What do I like about this job that they're offering me in general education? And then based on different variables, I selected a job in Western Massachusetts. And that was in regular ed? That was in special oh, education. Special ed. Yep. And in fact, I was the um, only full-time special educator in the school. There were a couple of part-time special ed folks as well who were itinerant and went school to school within our district. Uh, but my, I was 100% in that one school, which was great for a beginning teacher, mm -hmm. that you didn't have to worry about getting to uh, know lots of different schools and yes. taking your little cart to many places <laughs> and not having your own home in the school, your right. own classroom. And you did that for two years? I did it for four years, yeah. You did? And it was uh, actually in Massachusetts, too. I had preschoolers on my caseload. So as before, um, we serviced in Massachusetts, again, the federal laws based on the Massachusetts law at the time, that you could serve um, zero to five-year-olds and then kindergarten through. And when I was certified, I was certified birth to death in special education. <laughs> and I was also certified, uh, they told me that it would be forever and ever which wasn't quite, quite the case I found out uh, 14 years ago. Really? My anniversary is June 16th. <laughs> I know my anniversary for my certification is up next year. So I got a, a letter uh, 14 or so, 15 years ago, saying we're taking that lifelong certification back. And now you have to do a portfolio every five years if you want to remain, certification, remain um, certified uh -huh. in each of the areas. So because of my role here uh -huh. and being in the schools, and working with so many teachers, I feel that it's very important to keep up my certification in the six areas I'm certified in. And so I put a portfolio in of all of my artifacts, of all the things that I've done uh -huh. um, every five years. So that's why I know this is, we're coming, coming up, up on four year, and I have to now really look this upcoming year to see what kind of artifacts I can provide in reading and, and special ed and gen ed and, gen, and education administration and all that to be able to, yet again, next June, apply for certification. Yes, and probably not a bad idea to sort of have people who are practicing in the field mm -hmm. submit something every five years rather than be good for, for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it does help sometimes in um, more challenging situations mm -hmm. with teachers with whom I work uh, to be able to kind of drop the fact that I'm still certified and yes I have to do a portfolio for my certification and I have to engage in professional development that's meaningful to my certification areas and then uh, you know a state entity rules whether or not my professional development is appropriate to maintain certification so. Two years into your teaching you decided that you would con pursue a role as assistant principal mm -hmm. and how did that happen and why did you decide to take that leap? Well, I um, loved the, f the school and the faculty and the children and the families and it was very unusual uh, school in um, the Berkshires because some of the families were farming families mm -hmm. and some of the families were folks who really had their um, a, a residence in New York City I see. and would really, though because of the, uh, or other parts of New York, and decided that it would be better for the family, for the children's education, if they came to Massachusetts, to our school district for their schooling, mm. so that they would have dual residency, uh -huh. but they came and they were, many of them were very wealthy families. So mm -hmm. it was just a very unique situation and mm -hmm. I liked my role as a special educator, but I was single and unattached and I did soccer, coached soccer, and I was involved in all the, the plays and everything with the children and I just decided, 
that it would just be another thing I'd keep. Uh, it was a, a role that I would be able to keep teaching special uh, education, I but see. that as an assistant principal, I would take those duties on. And the principal actually uh, had a choice whether or not he, at the time, uh, wanted to continue teaching or teach part time. And so I had that option as well, but I wanted to continue teaching in special education more for the continuity of the children with whom I was working. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just thought it would be fun to do administration, and I, I enjoyed that role as well. And then I had some say in policy about including the kids with disabilities. So we ah. actually had inclusion before we knew what the term meant. So for the, particularly the younger grades, the kindergarten and first and second grade, Miss Gartland at the time would come <laughs> in in the afternoon. And if kids had done well and had got their work done in the morning, they might be able to come and work at the special table in the same classroom um, with Miss Gartland. A couple of the kids who were were kids with disabilities and had an IEP, never really got the hang of it that regardless if they get their work done in the morning or not, <laughs> they would still come to get to work with Miss Gartland in the, in, the, uh, in the afternoon in the uh, desk in the classroom. So and that was probably just as well. Yeah, so that, that was really, out. we did inclusion, but we didn't know that. But I enjoyed that, but as an, um, as an assistant principal, I enjoyed actually going in and um, making rounds and going into all the classes and getting to know the teachers better that I didn't share children with. And I just thought that that was um, a fun thing that I really enjoyed as well. But uh, it just, at that one point, I just decided that I didn't know enough about special ed and it was just an ever-growing field that if I were mm -hmm. going to make the leap uh, and, and give up, you know, what a better time after I had a little money in the bank to go back, give up my teaching job and go back full time as a PhD student at Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, so. And, and I, when you went into that, did you have any idea what you might do with that degree? I, I did um, think that I probably would go into higher education. Mm -hmm. I felt like, and I still feel like, that I can affect more students with disabilities this way mm -hmm. by not doing it directly, but by preparing a whole new set of folks to go out and work um, as special ed teachers or have that special ed expertise to be able to work, work directly with the kids with disabilities and then I kind of secondhand would be able to uh, influence what goes on in the classroom that way. So. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so you go to Penn State mm -hmm. and tell us a little bit about that experience. Did that involved, involve working with kids as part of your program? Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, at the time um, one of the top ten programs in special education across the country mm. uh, for doctoral studies and so it was very rigorous but I enjoyed it. Um, you had to have at least three years of ex teacher experience to get in uh, and it was um, very behaviorally based which I found consistent with the way I had taught and um, again grounded in, in theory and practical but because it was a PhD, it was much more theoretical mm -hmm. in some of the things we were learning. But I was lucky enough to get my all four years assistantships. So the first uh, uh, couple of years, I was a research assistant on several projects. Mm. So one of the professors had a grant for um, with the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to bring Native uh, Americans onto campus uh, as master's students. And so I worked as her grad assistant, and I supervised um, the Native Americans as they were getting special ed certification through their master's program and I would go out and supervise them as they were doing their internship. Fascinating. Um, I also got into taste of publishing. I edited uh, her book uh, and really was co-author though didn't get that, you know, as many doc <laughs> students didn't get that credit. In fact, when she thanked me in her book, my name was misspelled. <laughs> I edited the whole book, right, rewrote a lot of it, and, um, but that's the way it goes, paying your dues as a doc student. I did research, clinical research, with the head of the department, because I was his um, research assistant for a while. And the other fun thing I got to do then is to teach. So I um, got a taste of what it's like to teach lots of folks. The classes there, the intro to special ed courses there, typically had about 100 or 150 students in that. Oh my heavens. So it was either your loud teacher voice or using a microphone yes. to get the folks in the back. Uh, and I had mostly education majors. Many of them were special ed majors, but similar to here, um, everyone in education had to take an intro to special ed course, so that was my favorite course that I taught. And I even had athletes who weren't sure what they were going to do um, 
And so uh, I had a very famous football coach call me up every once in a while and ask how his particular football players were doing. And I thought at first I was being punked, if you will, in the term of today, thinking this is not really Coach Paterno. And yeah. in fact, it was. He would call up and ask every once in a while how uh -huh. so-and-so was doing uh -huh. and to let him know if he wasn't doing as good a job as he as he was doing on the football field. Uh -huh. So that was interesting. That is interesting, mm -hmm. especially at this point in time. Yes, yes. Hmm. Yeah. So from there, I, um, I had met my husband the first night. I don't uh -huh. remember that, that uh, he had been there a year earlier for his PhD. I don't remember that, but when it came time for me to um, start looking for positions, mm -hmm. I did scope my um, search down a bit. He had left a year earlier with his PhD in a very small field, so uh, he got a job with the government. So I decided to look just within a couple of hundred miles on the East Coast here mm -hmm. outside of DC. And I remember fondly my interview here at Towson, um, Joe Gacusker, uh -huh. with who you worked very closely, um, was my was the in charge of the search. And uh -huh. I can remember him saying on the phone, it would be too complicated for you to find a space on campus. So why don't I meet you? And I think it was an old Howard Johnson, which is no longer, which is a CVS or something. <laughs> he met me there. And I came on campus and um, interviewed for the whole day. And he was lovely, as was the whole search. It was a wonderful experience. And I decided um, to come back later in jeans, a few days later, and just walk the campus uh -huh. and talk to students uh -huh. and just get a sense. And because I knew that Towson had a really good reputation for teacher education, but I thought that I would get the other side, if you will, exactly. and talk to students and walk around. So. And that was convincing. It was very convincing because I, although I appreciate all the research opportunities and skills that I got from a Research One Institute at Penn State, um, I knew that I really wanted to get into, um, that I wanted to make my focus teaching and preparing um, the new generation of special ed teachers. So I wanted to come somewhere where the emphasis was on teaching. And so I, when I came here, um, although the, the, research, the emphasis was on teaching, I actually was in the first batch of folks who uh, were caught, caught, if you will, in between with new promotion and tenure requirements, and I yes. actually had to do service. When I came um, 27 years ago, um, I, there were a lot of folks who were associate professors or maybe even full professors who uh -huh. um, didn't have their doctorate, yes. um, hadn't published or presented at conferences, uh -huh. and but they were good, solid teachers. Uh -huh. And at that, when they were had started here, that's what um, you were recognized for and promoted on your good uh, teaching skills. Absolutely. So when and probably I probably some service as well. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And so when I came, actually, they were looking for somebody um, who had experience in special education mm -hmm. because the state, Maryland State Department of Education, just uh, the year before had said that um, everybody who was going for teacher certification had to have some expertise, um, some endorsement it was called. It wasn't necessarily a single course. That's the way that Towson went, but in special education, regardless of the field in which they went into. So we had some folks who had retooled was the term. So wonderful Dr. Margaret Kiley mm -hmm. in secondary ed and um, Dr. Marilyn Lewis mm -hmm. and Professor Liz Carpenter from Early Childhood had all retooled to become a more knowledge about special education. But uh, the college at the time was, was looking for somebody who had special ed as their primary focus and exactly. had experience and degrees in special ed to come and um, to work with the students who were getting certified in other areas but needed special ed uh, in this endorsement and then with the hopes of maybe having their own special ed major. But when you came, there was no special ed major. There was no special ed major. There was um, a collaboration, a, a limited collaboration, if you will, uh -huh. um, with Coppin State, which uh -huh. is a sister school or a historically black school, which, and they did have the special ed major. But uh -huh. at the time, um, the governing board uh, decided that colleges and universities that were in close to um, graphic proximity couldn't have duplicate, duplicate programs. Mm -hmm. So that Coppin had the special ed major, and the only way that we could get a piece of that pie was to work collaboratively with, mm -hmm. with them, and we did. Um, and that worked fine for a little while, and we actually had exchanges of faculty um, 
some of their faculty would come and teach some of the courses here, and some of ours would go to Coppin and teach some of the courses there. Uh, but there was uh, obviously a great need for special ed teachers, so the state then allowed for uh, other universities to put in for a bid to have special ed majors. And mm -hmm. so we had, we then slowly started piecing together a major, and we had, uh, based on the, the way that Maryland certifies special ed teachers, um, we had elementary special ed at the infant primary, special ed at the elementary, special ed at the secondary level. Uh, and that, uh, in the meantime, when some of the uh, Dr. Kiley and um, Dr. Lewis had retired, and Dr. Kiley and Professor Carpenter went back to their primary duties mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, were interested in special ed but didn't necessarily teach special right. education. Some of the semesters then it was me and 16, 17 part-time folks <laughs> putting together the service courses for those who needed intro to special ed and then we got into the field of the, the market of ma a major and so now we've grown from one person 27 years ago with a PhD and uh -huh. experience in special ed too. We probably have about 25 folks in the special ed department who are full-time special ed folks and about another 25 who are part-time um, folks who work for the special ed department. And of course, as you know, I started out in the general education department, I think it was called I at first. And then it was um, the reading, it might, and there might have been some, another d uh, name before then. Um, not certain. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember. Um, and then it was reading and special ed and instructional technology. And then uh, several years ago, we decided that we are big enough a program, and and, and the community is calling for more folks to be um, special ed certified. So we have we have our own department now. So it's yes. grown considerably in the last 27 years. And can you tell us a little bit how the the offerings, the programs? and special ed have also grown. So we went from credit count, uh -huh. which was what we were allowed to do, uh, where literally somebody at MSDE would go and count the courses of the students who came through our program and piece together to make sure this course would fit into this category and this course so that we have, I have colleagues now who work with me who came here and were my students and they were made of majored in L-Ed, elementary education, early child, and they added on the special ed certification. And we've grown from that to have majors in infant primary special ed, elementary level special ed, secondary in different content areas. Um, we also have the EASY program, which the state asked me and a few people to put together several years ago, which is L-Ed and special ed dual certification. So it's integrated, not like what I had to go through, two separate mm -hmm. uh, majors. And we just started with our ECSI, which is our infant primary special education dual certification program. And then we have master's programs and folks who are uh, go through ISTC for their doctorate with emphasis in special education. So it's grown considerably. It certainly has. And we are here on campus. And at one time, I was in PG County, Prince George's County, with our Easy to Assert uh -huh. program at the universities of Shady Grove and at what used to be called, what formerly was known as the Heat Center. It's, uh -huh. it's northern. It's, oh, is yes, it? It okay. still is, I think. So. That's the location, is the Heat Center. Right. Now, I'm not quite certain. Towson call it is Northern Towson University in Northeastern Maryland, Maryland, something like yeah. that. My heavens, you've been busy. I've been busy. But this doesn't really tell us all that you have been doing. You are involved nationally, regionally, in a variety mm -hmm. of things related to the field of education. I, you can't tell us everything, but would you share with us some of the highlights of your career sure. to date? And, and I just want to say, too, that when I was leaving Penn State and looking for positions, I had a few of my professors who were miffed that I was going to be going to a university or a college that would have as their primary focus teaching. Mm. Uh, and so because of that, I uh, didn't get all of the letters of recommendations, or I got them begrudgedly. Um, but I had one professor pull me aside and said, go and do what you want. But the one thing I want to tell you is stay connected with the field. And that was wonderful advice, especially coming from Pennsylvania to a state that I'd never lived in mm -hmm. um, with, uh, you know, an area and colleagues and school systems that I didn't know too much about. Um, and so as a way to stay connected nationally, uh, I made sure that I kept up my ties with the um, national organizations and the conferences that I 
had been going to as a doc student. And uh, so I still do a lot of that because I feel it's really important as we prepare our teachers here at Towson that we provide them the knowledge and skills and dispositions to make them successful and happy and be in a long career and to do well by their students, maybe in Baltimore County, maybe in surrounding counties, maybe somewhere else in Maryland, but also nationally. And certainly because they have to take a national test, I always feel like um, we need to provide them with skills that will make them successful here and elsewhere. And so I think I've modeled that well because I, um, as I said, when I came, I was a, a program of one, and so I needed to maintain my friendships as well as my professional relationships with folks from my doc program and on um, different national organizations. So Council for Exceptional Children certainly has been very important to me. Council for Learning Disabilities has been very imp important to me. And so I also feel it's important that even if somebody is involved nationally, that they also bring back and do service to the state organization. So I've been involved and on the board for state CEC for 27 years and started the Maryland Council for Learning Disabilities chapter here. But I'm on the board still of um, the Teacher Education Division, National Teacher Education Division for Council for um, Exceptional Children. And I'm on the board of trustees for the Council for Learning Disabilities. And that's probably been about 25 years. And mm. Just busy this weekend with our twice a year weekend meeting for the National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities, which is a committee that actually um, we write papers and try to influence legislation and policy. And several of our papers have actually been cited when the federal special ed law has been rewritten. So it's fun to um, have a side that's, uh, that prepares um, teachers and tries to get, make a program that's very, an experience that's very practical and we could talk about the professional development school, but also to stay connected nationally. And part of my role for Council for Learning Disabilities is that I, I advocate um, inside the Beltway for, with, um, with members of Congress. So that's kind of a fun thing yes. to keep me stimulated that way in terms uh -huh. of what goes on Absolutely. nationally. But I should probably talk a little bit about professional development schools and well, how important that is. Well, I would love is. for you to do that as well. Um, and can I sort of couch that mm -hmm. in uh, the language of what do you see as the essential elements to an effective teacher education program? Well, again, going back to my days at Westfield, just very practical. We need to provide them with the theory and the theoretical base. Um, I, wrote several of the courses and so classroom management is a perfect example where we start off with the theory at the beginning but it's heavy into the the practice what will you do in terms of managing your classroom um, so I always want to provide a program that is reflects the standards of our field and so for that's Council for Exceptional mm -hmm. Children and in task our initial certification um, standards uh, but to provide them with very practical experiences. So we try to get them out in the field as much as possible. We try to make sure that they can see the connection, even if it's a total classroom based on campus course, to what this would mean for real children. Um, and then a, a portfolio that kind of can sum up and um, really reflect their mastery, at least initially, of the standards. And the heavy thing for me is the professional development school, where they really get to know two schools really well. And because of the easy LED special ed program that the state asked me and a couple others to put together several years ago, uh, it's a year-long experience. And when I worked with some of my colleagues in Howard County, we actually put together the first ever in the nation <laughs> professional development school in special ed. And at that point, it was just for the only major that we had um, special ed at the infant primary level. I see. Okay. And so what school was that? That was Waverly Elementary School in Howard County. Uh -huh. And so, and we have a wonderful award from a couple of years ago that was we were our professional development school in Howard County was as a partner was honored by the only national PDS uh, organization and we received the first ever um, Maryland award for national recognition for our professional development school very nice uh, so it's very practical and it's very collaborative uh, and we make decisions with we the higher ed folks make decisions with the uh, school-based folks so including parents and previous intern. So I think that's very important that when our teacher candidates leave, and I, I, I always hear from lots of folks from several years back, and but particularly the first year I check in about this time of year when they're just about finishing their first year, and they talk about how 
they felt more like a second year teacher because they had such a great for, uh, PDS year. They got to know schools, two schools really well, and they got to know what questions to ask and what resources should be available for their either gen ed or special ed um, uh, children with disabilities that they work with because they go into either gen ed or special education. Um, so it's fun and rewarding, and now in my PDSs I have several of my mentors who were um, several generations back of our PDS uh -huh. students. Uh -huh. uh, and so I, every year I have an alumni panel come, <laughs> and I think we're up to nine years of folks who are um, prepared in the Howard County um, model, the dual cert model, who come towards the end of the semester and talk, talk about their first year, second year, all the way up to their, some mm -hmm. of them are in their ninth year, talking to our soon-to-be graduates uh, about what it's like and how to survive their first year and how their career differs from the first couple of years, their induction years, to later on. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us some of the elements in that PDS model that you think are particularly effective and essential? And we go by the national PDS standards for our PDS as well as the Maryland um, PDS standards, which some of us have been around long enough. We were actually um, helping to create those several years ago. And so, um, as I mentioned, one of the key things is, is collaboration, that we have uh, every other month, we have steering committees with um, Towson folks that the, my partner, my gen ed partner and I meet with school, the um, folks from each of the PDS schools who have been nominated to be on this steering committee, and we make decisions about um, courses, about experiences, about field trips, about guest speakers. Uh, uh, they are also very instrumental in um, portfolio review, mm -hmm. as well as the, if you're a mentor, then you take mentor training that we co-design. Uh, and, and, and a mentor is what we used to call a cooperating, cooperating teacher. teacher. Right. Okay. And so yesterday we were in meetings for our summer strategic planning, the site liaisons and me for our summer strategic planning coming up. And we look at what went well and what we should do to improve for next year. And so um, with our dual certification program, it's really wonderful because our students take a course that I designed on co-teaching and collaboration. So they bring something that I didn't bring when I went mm -hmm. to the classroom, and that's uh, skills to be able to be a good co-teacher, whether mm -hmm. they're, they end up in being a gen ed teacher or a special ed teacher. And so they um, co-teach then with their mentor, whether, in, whether they're in their special ed rotation or in their gen ed rotation. And so that's also something I love about Howard County Schools is they embrace a lot of the same principles that we do here at Towson for preparing s people to be certified, particularly in special education. Um, so there's a lot of co-teaching that goes on with our interns and their third grade gen ed teacher or their special ed resource room mentor as well. Um, so it's very practical. Um, they get hands on. They have to do research. They have to give back to the school. Uh, they have to do a project which would in, uh, they select a student that they have to actually positively affect the behavior of the child whose behavior is inappropriate and impacting negatively on either academics or social or behavior. Uh, and then they present that to their teams, the data. They have to write an individualized education program, an IEP for a student, a real student, and they have to present it to the parents. Um, they have to give back, as I said, they have to do at least 20 hours of community service above and beyond uh, the teacher day. Uh, and so they do, they've run homework clubs, they present at STEM nights um, uh, or math nights or literacy nights. Um, and so they get, we try to get them very involved in what it means to be a teacher so that when they go out and they take their first position, they know it's not just teaching during the school day, but to be involved in their community and to get to know the community well, especially if it's not a community that they've grown up in. So. That was a lot. Um, what have we forgotten to talk about that you think is of particular importance? Probably just a little advice to people who are contemplating going into the field. Okay. Um, you don't go into it for the monetary <laughs> rewards. <laughs> um, nowadays we say if that's the case, you want education, you go into the textbook <laughs> business and all that. Truly. Um, but you, you really have to be dedicated and really want to um, affect your students and the lives that they will lead. And 
know that it's long and hard and the summer's off thing is really kind of a myth <laughs> that you hopefully you do get some time to refresh but nowadays that it's really important for um, some kind of a professional learning community to be involved in to continue ones it was professional development professional learning ongoing so you might take some of the summer to do that but um, to be there for the right reasons to um, be a champion for every child who comes through in your classroom regardless of whether or not they would be somebody who, you, if they were your age, you would choose to be their friend or not, that uh -huh. signing on to be a teacher means that you're giving everyone an equal opportunity to do their best and kind of making sure that you're going. Um, to me, I would like it if my graduates could say, I go above and beyond for each of my students, and uh -huh. I try to make sure that I can reach them where they come. So. Anything else? No, I think this is a wonderful a wonderful product that you're putting together because in so many of the fields, and this is something in special ed that we're lacking, is uh, to have an oral history for the folks who are now graying or retiring, graying, or uh -huh. are no longer with us. And so this is really going to be fabulous for folks to look back and say, ah, I remember those days. Or, wow, oh, that's absolutely. what it was really like. And I think it's important that we interview the folks who were here from the beginning. And since you really were here on the ground floor, or maybe lower than that even, um, this is an important contribution that you make to, to the oral history. Yep. And we really appreciate your doing this. You're welcome.